Hi folks, welcome back. Uh, this lecture is some commentary and discussion questions on the introduction to the Fobbit book, that's video game narrative and criticism, playing the story. I wanted to uh, start the discussion by talking about what I see as two rather silly extremes in game studies or game criticism. And I think both of these are equally fallacious, but uh, they go something like this. And we've already touched on this first one a little bit uh, when we talked about the ludologist and Espinar's theft. Uh, but this, according to this view, theory, quote unquote, is useless for understanding video games. By theory, I mean their literary theory or something, uh, some kind of film studies theory. Uh, basically anything that was built and would apply to uh, something other than a video game. And the idea, it's not hard to see why they would think that. Uh, you could say, well, video games are fundamentally different than reading a short story or watching a film. Uh, so all of this theory that's been built to support those other media have nothing to offer uh, video games. And you can even get on the wrong track if you keep trying to uh, sort of force fit it. Now, I think there's some merit to this view, but I think, and I think Thobbit would agree, obviously, with this. Uh, nevertheless, we can adapt those uh, theories, and it makes a lot of sense, and there's really no reason to reinvent the, uh, reinvent the wheel with this stuff. Uh, the other view is that all you need is the theory, that you don't actually have to play the games in question. Now, this seems ridiculous to some of you, probably, the idea that I could call myself a video game expert or a video game scholar and never actually <laughs> play any video games, uh, but it's more prevalent than you might think, and I think some people actually take pride themselves on being able to write article, journal articles or books about games they've never played. Uh, and I guess the idea here, again, is that they're really only interested in, in, in the theory and they don't need the actual practice of playing the game. Again, I think both of these views are really just kind of ridiculous. And really, where, where I want you to be and where Thabit wants us to be is somewhere in between these views so that we're actually playing the games and focusing on that part and also using relevant theory. All right, so let's move on then into page three. And we're talking about this term interactive. Now, a lot of games are described as interactive, interactive novels or interactive movies. I've seen some games uh, describe themselves that way. And it's usually the term that comes up when I want to talk about with a class. You know, tell me about the difference between playing a game and reading a book or playing a game and watching a movie. Uh, what's really different about those activities? And most students would say, well, the, 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 difference, the main difference is interactive. Uh, the watching the, the movie or reading the story, that's not interactive. Uh, playing the game is interactive because you interact uh, with a game, right? Uh, but that seems like common sense, right? Uh, but Thobbit has a bone to pick with the term. I'm reading here from page three. He says, the narrative in games is too curious and fascinating to be left labeled as merely interactive. Interactivity is a dull word. It does not say anything about how to play a story and how a story affects us. Interactive, the word, conceals how gameplay reshapes the way we produce, perceive, and respond to fiction. Now, I think I know why Thabit doesn't like this word, or at least the way it's commonly used, but I wanted to turn it over to you so, and ask you, what do you think about the term interactive? Do you agree with Thabit that it might be uh, sort of uh, getting off on the wrong track, I guess, to use this word? All right, so if we don't like this term interactive, you know, then what are we going <laughs> to talk about instead? And I think this is really what I like about Thabit is uh, where he goes with his ideas about game narrative. So he says on page three, a game narrative is a player's own story with a psychological dimension and a unique meaning-making process. So this is a, a really key concept here. So you wanted to talk about game narrative. Uh, one way might be Let's say, what is the narrative of Bioshock? What is the game narrative of Bioshock, right? Now, some people would say, well, go to Wikipedia, read the plot <laughs> summary there, or look in the manual and read about the backstory, you know, and that's, what's the, that's the narrative, right? I thought it would say, though, that's not the game narrative, or at least that's not how he envisions it. Uh, instead, we want to think about each person that plays that game, each time uh, he or she plays that game, uh, they're going to come away with a different story, right? Different things are going to happen in that game. Uh, there's going to be different effects on the player. Uh, the player, if it's the second time you're playing it, you're going to know more than you did the first time, so you'll probably make different choices. Uh, so there's a lot that changes every time you play the game, right? And that's what he wants to focus in on. 
particularly how uh, when you make choices and you do things, uh, those are going to have uh, impacts, you know, emotional impact, mental impact, uh, maybe even your heart rate goes up. You know, who knows uh, all the different uh, variables that work there. But we can go back later once we have that story and analyze it and refl uh, reflect on it. We'll talk more about that in a second. Now, another thing about games that's uh, different than most other media is in the second bullet point here. So the player must participate in the narration because the story is also told by the environment in response to the player's actions, all non-verbally. Uh, so there's a couple of ideas, key ideas here. One is just, you know, how cool is it, uh, especially in most modern games, uh, there's all kinds of stuff that's going on all around the player, right? Some of it's directly related to what the player is doing or the purpose or the mission or whatever. Uh, but other stuff is there, what I would just say is kind of there for flavor, for context, to kind of make the world seem more alive. So you might find a couple of people just having a conversation. You can eavesdrop on them. Uh, but if you just take your hands off the controller, you'll see all this kind of stuff going on all around you. And a lot of it is uh, nonverbal. So it's not always just text or cutscene or something like this. The world is basically alive, and it's going to be it's going to change dramatically every time you you play through it. And even if you go into the same zone a few a few days later, it might be <laughs> a lot of different stuff going. I keep thinking about World of Warcraft, you know, and how different the same environment, the same uh, part of that world might be on any given day. Uh, so that would be something you would totally miss out on if you were just reading that sort of standard you know, Bioshock plot, right? Uh, that's the, uh, the environment responding to the player's actions. A problem, uh, maybe to, uh, to clarify this a bit further, if you think about a game like Fable, uh, that game is noted uh, especially because, uh, depending on the sort of ethical decisions that you make, the other people in the game, the other characters will respond to you differently. So the villagers might not be so welcoming if you've been a total jerk uh, than if you've been sort of the heroic figure, right? So, uh, again, to get back to Thabit, he says the player is central to both the telling and the reception. Now, another key idea here as well, we've already said this, that, uh, you know, to some extent, kind of the problem I have with people that don't actually play the games they're talking about is that every playthrough will be unique, right? And if you're just, if, 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 if I was just telling you the story of Bioshock, uh, I don't know if, if I could, if you could really say you knew what that narrative was because you hadn't experienced it firsthand, right? It would just be me sort of telling you about my experience, but your experience might be entirely different if you were to actually play the game. Uh, so I think that's getting into this point here, right? So we'll talk more about the telling part in a minute, but uh, just to, to bear in mind that you're sort of, when you're playing a game, you're sort of co-narrating it at the same time you're kind of co-presenting it or co-receiving it. Uh, probably the easy, easiest way to think about that is just uh, like with Bioshock where you can control the camera. Uh, you basically are deciding what you want to focus on, what you want to look at uh, as you're going through these rooms. You might ignore things or really uh, stare at them intently. And so in a way you're kind of uh, participating in not just the telling of the story but also the way that it's received. Okay, now I want to talk about uh, this tension between the player and what I would call the designer of the game, or the game designers. Uh, he talks about the, uh, he, he has a couple different terms for this, but sort of the world, world versus, or machine, man versus machine. Uh, so anyway, this is the point. Uh, the player simultaneously co-narrates and impersonates the protagonist. Uh, so this, if you think about what happens when you play a game, you can, as a game designer, you can you can make choices. You can set up this game world. Uh, you might have in mind what you want to have happen, or what you want the what you want the player to do. Uh, but as you know, as you play these things, you might decide to do something different. You can even do things the designer of the game never even imagined anybody would ever do, right? And there you are doing it. So it's always kind of a co-narration. So this is what's if you think about writing a video game, that's one way. It's very different than say writing a short story because uh, you have to share some of, the, some of the narrative responsibilities, I guess, with that player, because the player will be making choices. Uh, now, this bit about impersonating the protagonist is interesting as well. Uh, some games, you uh, have a character that you're playing as. Uh, say, for example, when you play Halo, you're usually playing as a Master Chief, let's say. Or uh, some games let you create your own character. 
Uh, some games seem to have a very well-defined character theme, like Duke Nukem, for example, or uh, Max Payne, uh, these sorts of games, where you have a predefined character that you're playing as. And this idea of impersonating the protagonist is interesting, because usually when you play a game, you're thinking, that's me on the screen. So if somebody shoots you in Call of Duty, you say, oh, somebody shot me. Uh, you don't say, somebody shot my character. Uh, you know, nobody says that, right? So, in a way, it's always you projecting yourself into the game. Uh, but on the other hand, maybe you want to sort of do some role playing and you want to, instead of just being yourself, you know, kind of want to pretend to be this other character for a while. Uh, so there's kind of an interesting dynamic there. He'll talk about that later in the book, but I just thought it was, uh, I want to point that out now. Uh, so he goes on to say there are two conflicting narrators telling the same story, a human and a machine, with one defying the other's superior narrative authority to make a difference in what is told. Uh, so I wanted to pause here for a second and have you uh, think about this quotation. And I think a good way to do that would be to think about a game uh, you might have played uh, that seemed to force you into doing something you didn't really want to do, or you, you discovered a situation that you couldn't do anything about, uh, some of the classic examples are maybe there's a character that has to die in this game, in, in the story of the game. Doesn't matter what you do to try to prevent it, there's nothing you can do. That character is just sort of destined to die as part of that game. Uh, so, how do you feel about that? When, th when that sort of thing happens in a game, uh, how does that make you feel? Does it, do you feel like you've been cheated in a way, or do you feel like that's just a, a necessary part of the, experiencing a game narrative? All right, to move on, we want to talk about this uh, incubator. And this is what we'll be doing when we do our player response essay. So I wanted to uh, talk about this a little bit here. So this is on page five. He says, this is an exploration of how to account for meaning making through the reproduction of gameplay experience as a post factum narrative, an incubator for critical musing. Uh, so again, think about what I've said before about how uh, you got this game, you play it once, you come back a year later, you play it again, uh, your friend plays it, all of those different playthroughs will be different. Uh, you'll have different uh, experiences every time you do that, right? But it's kind of hard to analyze that, you know, the gameplay experience as it's happening, right? Uh, so what we're talking about here is uh, when this idea of a post-factum narrative is your, uh, I think about it as kind of a journal or a diary uh, that you're keeping as you play a game. So you play, let's say, the first part of Bioshock, and you're making notes about the stuff that's happening, the decisions that you're making, your thoughts, your feelings as you go along. And then once you have that written record, uh, this post-factum narrative, then you have something uh, that everybody else can read, start to analyze, and, and what he calls a, a critical musing can begin to take place, right? Because you've produced an artifact based on that experience. So we'll delve more into this uh, later on, but you know, you, you probably get a pretty good idea of where this is headed uh, already. You could imagine, uh, just for example, you, had, you and your friend both play the first level of Bioshock, and you both write about what happened during that gameplay session. You're not going to have the identical sessions, right? Those narratives will be different. Uh, your friend will probably focus on different things and have different experience, uh, different emotional reactions than you did, let's say, or at least would describe it differently. All right, we want to delve a little bit into the theory, and we'll talk a lot more about this in the, in the next chapters, but. Uh, here he's just sort of briefly introducing reader response theory. And if you've had a literary theory course, uh, then you know that there's lots of different literary theories out there, different ways to interpret text, different ways to talk about texts. And they have their own uh, sort of questions that they ask and things they focus on. Uh, but we're talking about one called reader response theory. And that's a pretty well-established school, but I want to focus in on Norman Holland and the quotes that uh, Thavik gives from him. So the first quote here is about reader response theory, and it says, readers turn the text into a private world to work out their fundamental psychological needs. So you think, what happens if somebody reads a short story? Holland would say, well, as you're reading that short story, you're turning that short story into a private world to work out your fundamental psychological needs. And so you see there's almost kind of a therapeutic uh, angle to this. He goes on to say their identity theme is, or this, this, this identity, identity theme uh, will come up a few times here. What is that? Well, it's the pattern of psychological conflicts, defense mechanisms, and coping strategies readers confront while responding to the text. 
Uh, so again, you're reading a short story, something horrible happens in the story, you're going to have uh, some kind of psychic or uh, psychological effect on this. You're going to sort of resolve it in your mind, think about it a certain way. Uh, it's going to have some kind of impact on you. And according to Holland, uh, again, everyone, no two readers will have the same exact experience when that happens, right? Uh, somebody might not find it funny. You know, somebody else might be deeply moved by it. Uh, somebody else might not even uh, might just read right on and not even uh, pause to have any, <laughs> any kind of feelings at all, right? Uh, but uh, by extension, uh, if you can get somebody talking about those experiences they had reading that short story, uh, then you can start to connect those experiences and their reactions to basically their personality, right? What kind of person is that? Uh, you can learn about how a person is or how, what a person thinks of the world, I guess, just by having them uh, read stories and then talk about the way they were affected by those stories. So we're not going to be reading stories, we'll be playing games. So Thobbit uh, proposes what he calls the player response theory. So instead of reader response, player response. Sensible enough, uh, but there's going to be some big differences. Uh, so this is on page 7. He says, we can treat the game story as the player's own experience, where fears, desires, and anxieties are projected onto the fictional world. Uh, let me just uh, read this next one here, and then we'll, I'll try to explain this. So this is not only mental or emotional, but actual and mutual. The transaction is real and not merely imagined, because characters react and events happen and change under the player's personal influence. So again, with the reader response uh, theory, and lots of other literary theories, by the way, uh, they'll talk about how uh, you know, the, uh, the text is kind of a private world and that everybody has a, an interpretation of it and everybody's experience reading that text is different and so on and so forth. But reality is it's the same text. <laughs> Those are the same words. Uh, so it's, a lot of this is kind of metaphorical almost when you're talking about standard texts. Uh, but when you're talking about a video game, well then you're not talking about some, you know, in theory the text is different for every reader. Now this is in reality uh, you could play that game, two, people, two different people play the same game, way different stuff is going to happen, right? The stuff on their screen is going to be different. Uh, you're not going to have the same exact uh, scenarios. I mean, cutscenes, I guess those would always be the same, right? But if you're just uh, wandering around in Bioshock, uh, your experience will be different than somebody else's in a literal, in a literal way. The, the stuff that's presented to you will be different. It's not just all mental or emotional or sort of uh, something you think about later, but actually different. So I want to stop there. I think we've uh, sort of introduced some of these concepts uh, from the Thobbit book. If you have any questions or comments or feedback for me, please don't hesitate to put that in the box. And see you next time.